Hey, Jamie here, and welcome to Module 10, where we're going to dive into negotiation. Now, this module is not only and solely focused just on your offer negotiation. So, in part one, what I'd like to lay out is negotiation principles and, co and a core framework for negotiating not just for your offer, but also for everything else in your life. Now, the reason I believe that negotiation is such a crucial life skill, and if you recall when we talked about in Module 1, the strategic growth in the marketplace and how do you monetize your value in the marketplace, one of the most important soft skills to develop in order to do that is negotiation, both personally and professionally. So in this Part 1, we're going to dive into under, understanding why negotiation is a crucial life skill, the psychology behind a negotiation, as well as negotiation strategy and several principles for successfully influencing someone else. Now, negotiation is a crucial life skill that will positively affect both your life and your career. And the reason it's so beneficial is, as we talked about in Module 1, it's how you monetize your value. You could spend an entire year improving your skills, improving your knowledge, and becoming more capable of, of doing something or adding value. But if you're not able to influence somebody in order to get the opportunity or to persuade someone that you truly are worth more than you were previously, you'll never be able to monetize the value. And this is what a lot of people run into in their careers is they develop themselves, but then they don't get promoted. Or they develop themselves and they don't get a raise or the bonus or they don't get the job that they want. And it's because they haven't learned how to influence and negotiate for what they truly want. They haven't figured out how to communicate and sell their value. And that's really all negotiation negotiating is. Communicating and influencing someone to see your interests and your perspective and to make a decision that aligns with what you're looking for. So the second reason the second reason negotiation is so beneficial is this is how in your career you're going to accelerate and advance your career. Now, if you're currently at a company or if you previously were at a company, you've probably seen that there are standard or expected timelines for advancement within the company. So if you're in corporate America, if you're in a Fortune 500, maybe you know that the analyst track is between two to four years long. And then the frontline manager track is maybe you're there for two to four years and then there's mid-level management, and then upper-level management, and then senior management, executive, etc. So there's most companies have a set timeline. Now, the, th the reason they have those timelines is because that is serving the average employee. Now, our whole goal, our whole mission, this entire program is about not being average, being far superior to average, being so far in advance and being in the top 10% that you are the best or one of the best and you need to be compensated for that you need to be you need to monetize that value and the only way to do that and and receive promotions faster within a company is by negotiating the only way to win opportunities within your career that other people need to wait for you got to be able to negotiate so one example is let's say that you're entering directly into college or directly out of college. Let's say you're entering a company and you know that the standard path is you're going to be in this position for three years. Well, my challenge to you would be how do you get promoted within two years? How do you cut an entire year off of your promotion track? Or let's say you're a manager and you want to get promoted and you know that the typical manager is in that position for let's say four years or five years. My challenge to you is how can you make that happen within three or four years? How can you shave an entire year or two off of your track? Well, the most important thing for you to do is you have to be able to negotiate. And then finally is value creation and what's called expanding the pie. So through negotiation, you're able to create outcomes or opportunities that other people can't see, or if they do see it, they don't know how to make it work. And negotiating is being able to take your perspective, understand other people's perspectives, and then creatively coming up with a solution that 
fits both yours and theirs and creates an outcome that previously never existed. And that's kind of the one plus one equals three, where you came up with an idea and influenced everybody that it should and would benefit everyone. And then you executed and all of a sudden you created value that previously would not have existed. Negotiation is very powerful in that way as well. So what it really is, is number one, you're listening and understanding to the other person's perspective. A lot of people believe that negotiation is winning and losing. That's not the case at all. Negotiation is understanding people's perspectives and what is driving those people's perspectives and then figuring out what will influence them based on what they have in their mind. Now, if you are only stuck in your own head, if all you think about and care about is yourself, you'll never be able to influence people. It's that simple. And that's why so many people who are pigheaded and stubborn and, and selfish are horrible salespeople and horrible negotiators and horrible leaders. And it's because negotiation is empathy. You have to understand the other person's perspective. Otherwise, it's just going to turn into an argument where you're digging your heels in the ground. They're digging their heels in the ground. And it's just literally defending each other's opinions. So in order for you to negotiate well and successfully and maintain a great relationship with someone, you have to come from a place of first listening and understand the other person's perspective. But then after that is you have to build trust and rapport while at the same time gathering information. So the reason trust and rapport is so important is no one likes being told what to do. No one likes being sold. No one likes being manipulated. And so if someone doesn't trust you, they're not going to listen. And the moment that the listening stops, you know that all they're doing is defending themselves or defending their opinion or their judgment. Well, in that case, they'll never be influenced. They'll never change their mind. So before anyone will ever even think about changing their mind or potentially listening to what you have to say or, or changing um, what they believe should be done, they have to trust you and they have to have rapport with you. Now, the other benefit is if you remember from networking in module seven, the best way to build trust and rapport with someone is to ask questions and listen and show that you are paying attention. You're making the other person feel heard, understood, acknowledged, and appreciated. Well, as you're asking questions, you're also going to be gathering information. That information is going to tell you a lot more about their interests, their wants, and their needs. When you understand someone's interests, wants, and needs, you then know how to position what it is that you're going to say, which is your strategic positioning. You're going to know how to position it so that you, you can influence them and their perspective in a way that they will think about or actually take into consideration. And then the last part is obviously the, the outcome or the goal of what you're shooting for is to influence their decisions and their behavior to achieve your interests. And to have them, and, and a lot of people m confuse influence and sales and negotiation with just outright manipulation and taking advantage of people. It's not some type of sorcery. It's, it's not a, a witchcraft thing to, to negotiate or, or to influence somebody. There's, it's, it's understanding how do people make decisions, how do people think, and then leading their thought process down a series of, of questions and insights until eventually they see your perspective. That's really the outcome you're shooting for. Can you get the other person to see your perspective and actually agree with it? So if anything, how I want you to think about influence is think of it as when you first enter into a conversation, imagine like zero to 100. When you first start the conversation, it's at 50. It's dead center. But then throughout the conversation, you want them to start leaning more towards your perspective. And if they, by the end of the conversation, are leaning more towards your perspective, more than likely you will have influenced them and they will change their decisions in, in how they think about something. So we negotiate whenever there is not a clearly defined agreement because of differing perspectives for the same point of focus. 
So for example, in your offer negotiation, you're going to want X dollar amount and they're going to be wanting to offer Y dollar amount. Well, the same point of focus is your compensation. Well, you have a different perspective than the employer. So there's going to be different interests and desires between you and the other person. And that difference in your interests versus theirs is the negotiation gap. And that's what you're discussing with someone in order to close that gap into finding an agreement where both people agree that it's a desirable outcome. Now, skilled negotiators deeply understand all perspectives involved. So in your offer negotiation, it may just be two parties. It may just be you and the recruiter or you and the hiring manager or you and the team leader. But there are going to be other instances and, and perhaps when you actually are, are in the next position and you have advanced your career, you may be in a situation or on a project where you need to influence multiple people, three people, four people, five people. Well, what your team manager wants or what your CEO wants might be very different than what the accountant or the CFO wants versus what the client or the customer wants. So before you ever put together a negotiation strategy, the very first thing you must do is ask yourself, do I know what all parties want? Do I know the interests and desires of everyone who's sitting at this table? And if you don't, you're leaving yourself exposed to a blind spot and you may totally misinterpret and position what you're saying or yourself incorrectly and fail to influence someone or multiple people. So always ask yourself, do I truly know what the interests and desires are of the people that I'm speaking with? So who must learn to negotiate? Everyone. That's it. If, if, if someone believes that they don't need to know how to sell or influence or negotiate, it's, um, they're sadly missing one of the most important skills in life because everybody who works with people, resources, and opportunities needs to know how to influence other people. Every, every leader in the world has become a leader because they knew how to communicate and influence everybody who gets promotions, everybody who gets raises, everyone who receives opportunities that other people don't, it's because they know how to influence and negotiate. So I can't stress enough how important this skill is, not just, not just for this career advancement, not just for getting the next position, but for your entire life, for the next five years, 10 years, 30 years, you need to be able to influence. And not just one people, but a group of people. And, it, and, and the same principles and framework applies. So for our personal lives, you're going to negotiate really large purchases like cars, um, your, your, your house, investments, and then also family and friends, influencing them. I mean, if you're a parent or if you have parents, which are most people in the world, <laughs> um, there have been times where you wanted to influence your family to agree to something. Well, if you don't know how to influence, it probably just turned into an argument, which is really what happens to most people because they, they don't actually know this skill. So that's why so many people argue is because they don't know how to influence properly. And then in terms of our professional lives, we're going to negotiate all the time in our careers with clients, customers, other people on our teams or, or cross collaboration between other departments or other teams or even senior leaders. And that's, so the third area here is leaders and managers and not just your manager or your leader, but leaders and managers of other teams within the company or outside of your company within the industry and then colleagues. And these could be other people within the company, you know, getting someone to do a favor for you and building a, re a relationship uh, that's mutually beneficial. So there's many different ways professionally that you're going to need to apply negotiation. So in terms of how you can learn negotiation in your professional life and in your personal life, well, the very first thing is you need to actually train and develop the skill. You need to learn how to negotiate. And there's a process just like riding a bike, you know, you have to understand the core principles or in terms of finance or accounting or marketing, like any other type of knowledge or skill there, there's a foundation that you need to learn sales and influence and negotiation is the same. So first is doing the training and the development and internalizing it. And then the second is actually practicing it.
preparing, okay, if this is the situation, this is how I believe that I need to prepare for it. You practice internally and by yourself, just like you would for, uh, as we talked about in module nine for your interviews, you're, you're preparing and practicing for your interviews. You do the exact same thing for your, for your negotiation. And then live negotiating experience. This is, <laughs> you could plan all you want. It doesn't mean the things are gonna go well. So the more experience that you get under your belt of actively trying to negotiate, the better you'll get. And that's, that's the exact same with any other skill. And then finally is further personal development and life experience. Negotiation is something that you perpetually focus on. You never stop. You always try to get better with it. Okay. So it requires understanding humans. And the basis behind humans is we are habitual, we are predictable, and we are emotional. And because of that, we make decisions based on both logic and and knowledge. But how we make those decisions is usually emotional first, and then we justify with logic. So this is thousands of years old in terms of how to influence people. And the first recorded, and there's you know people debate about what, what came first, whether it was um, some of the Chinese literature or the Greek literature. It doesn't matter, um, but the most common is Aristotle's The Art of Rhetoric, where he introduced ethos, pathos, and logos. And ethos is credibility. How credible are you as an individual in a certain scenario? And pathos is emotion. Can you influence the other person's emotions and stir up their emotions? And then the third is logic. Are you presenting a logical argument or series of arguments that makes sense? And the way that you want to think about influence is people will make emotional decisions, but they have to justify with logic. More often than not, people are missing one or two of these three pieces. Now, ethos, which is your credibility, that's your reputation. If you can build trust and rapport with somebody, you have the credibility necessary for the conversation. But most people rely on one of P of pathos and logos. Often they're missing one or the other. So in this case, what you're going to need to do is understand the other person's emotion, present present something that aligns with their emotions and their interests, but then you're backing it up with a logical explanation. And have you ever had it where you knew something was a good idea, but you just couldn't get yourself to do it? Or someone said something and you agreed with it, but you just you just didn't take action on it? And you it's like you wanted to, but you were hesitant. Or let's say that you wanted to buy something, you really wanted it, but then you didn't buy it. Well, in that last case, so where you really wanted to buy something, but you didn't do it, emotionally, you really wanted it. Pathos-wise, you had the emotion. You were there. You wanted to commit. But logos, logic-wise, you couldn't justify it. In your mind, you're like, this is too expensive. I can't justify it. There's no good reason why I should spend this money on that at that high of a price. So you were stuck and you didn't make the decision. Well, that's how most people get stuck in negotiation. They only have one of those two pieces, pathos or logos. Okay, so if we wish to influence and negotiate effectively, we must first understand human emotional patterns and then understand how to provide justifying logic so that people don't get stuck in the decision-making process. So. Several predictable emotional patterns that are important to understand. And this is for all human behavior. This is not just for, you know, again, this is not just for your offer negotiation. This is for any time you're working with people. These are important principles to know because it applies to every human being. Okay, so one, a common emotional pattern is survival and a scarcity mindset. So you've probably heard this before, that people will go out of their way more strongly or, or more significantly to avoid losses than they will to try to gain a better position. And a simple example for you is let's say that you have an opportunity for a 95% chance of winning $10,000 or a 100% chance of winning $9,500. Which would you choose? Take a second to think about that. So a 95% chance of winning 10,000 or a 100% chance of winning 9,500. Which would you choose? Okay, 
Well, now what if it was a 95% chance of losing 10,000 or a 100% chance of losing 9,500? Which would you choose? Now, in the first case, I'm going to go back one slide and go to the first case. In this case, 95 of winning or 100% of winning 9,500, I'm willing to bet you probably said, well, I would hate to lose that 5% and not get anything. So you probably went, went bleh, you probably went with 100% chance of winning 9,500 because for you, that's certainty. You're absolutely certain you're going to get that money and you'd hate to lose it because of that 5% risk. But in this second scenario, you most likely said, well, I have a 5% chance of not losing anything. So why would I not try? You know, I'm already going to lose 9,500. Well, what's 10,000? That's only 500 more. I might as well try to take the 5% and not have to pay anything. This is irrational because you're actually taking more risk by shooting for the 95% than the 100%. You could lose more money and that's a pretty high percentage. 95%, you're most likely going to be paying 10,000. But that's human behavior. We always go out of, or not always, but very, very often, and especially if it's subconscious, we will always try to go out of the way to loot or to avoid loss. So the second part of this uh, survival and scarcity mindset is energy converse, con, bleh, conservation. So the way that we do this is think of this as our minds are lazy and we want to do as little work as needed mentally and physically because why would we want to exert more energy than necessary? So people are very quick to form judgments and form first impressions because they don't want to think too hard. That's why we are so biased because our minds instantly try to, all right, they see something, they interpret it, and then they just try to bucket, categorize it. All right, this person is this, this, and this. This person is this, this, and this. And we immediately form judgments. It's because we don't want to think too hard. It's easier to judge than it is to analyze. And that's why humans always judge. And then the third part is here is short-term gratification and impulsiveness versus a long-term focus and a focus on return on investment. This is why people so significantly value short-term gratification and always and constantly procrastinate. It's because they're just trying to conserve energy mentally. Okay, so in terms of what are the big takeaways for you here? Well, when you're thinking about negotiating or influencing, remember that you want to appeal to someone's loss aversion and eat the complexity. Now, what I mean by eat complexity is don't make the other person think too hard. If there's going to be an analysis, if there's going to be a lot of work to do to prove something, do that work for the other person. The, the moment, a lot of people try to influence people to do things, but there's going to be a lot of work to be done in order to get them to understand that. Well, you need to front load all of the analysis. You need to do the hard work yourself and then present it and make it super easy for the other person to say, yes. So you need to eat the complexity. And now going back to the loss aversion. So in terms of how you could actually use this in a negotiation is let's say, let's use a simple example. So negotiating a car, let's say you go in and there's a retail price on the car of let's say it's $40,000. Well, in your mind, for you, it's a binary decision. I'm either going to buy or not buy. But in the salesperson's eyes, there's a spectrum of outcomes. Yes, it's either you buy or don't buy, but in their mind, they're worried about at what price are you going to buy? So the way that you can take advantage of this is one, negotiate, of course, for the lower price, but it's not about showing them that they're still going to make a lot of money on the price that you're offering. It's, look, it's either this or I don't buy. Well, all of a sudden, that salesperson's not worried about the price anymore. More specifically, they're worried about whether or not you're going to buy from them. So that's the way that it's, you're influencing them not on the price. You're influencing them on you could lose the entire sale. That's going to give you a lot of negotiation leverage. Okay, so loss aversion, eat the complexity. So second, a need for certainty and control is another human emotional pattern. 
we want to always feel certain and we want to feel in control of the situation and we want to feel like we have the decision making power. So control and autonomy. This is why people love control and autonomy. It gives us a sense of feeling of certainty and when people feel like they're in control, they feel like they can better predict the outcome. And that that gives them the more predictable something is, the more certain they feel about it and it gives them a feeling of stability. So we can influence people by that by providing this sense of control and autonomy. And then secondly, is people are closed off defensive or irrational when they feel like they're not in control. And ha- I'm sure you've probably had this before in your life where you felt like you weren't in control of something. And because you didn't feel like you were in control, you felt stressed or anxious or um, angry or frustrated or uncertain or sad, like all these negative emotions get stirred up when you all of a sudden feel like you don't have control and you are pretty much at the whim of someone else or a situation or some external circumstance that you don't know how it's going to play out and it makes you completely uncertain about the future. And then the third part is like the familiar and dislike the unfamiliar. People like people who are like themselves. People dislike people who are unlike themselves. So people naturally and emotionally, they don't like change. They don't like difference, they don't like uncertainty, and they don't like the unknown. So biggest takeaway here is when you're negotiating or influencing someone, you want to appeal to their need for control, for familiarity, and their need for certainty. So a third emotional pattern is a need for social cohesion. Um, An interesting point that a lot of people, I mean, you probably know this intuitively, but we haven't actually broken it down and thought about it logically and how it applies to our lives. So 100,000, 200,000 years ago, before humans had developed language, we were emotional creatures that communicated non-verbally through facial expression, through hand gesture, through signals. So there was a point where we didn't verbally communicate. And that was tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years in progression. So that's why we're one of the most emotional, socially cohesive species, or we are the most um, socially cohesive species on the planet, which means that we constantly, it is in our primitive brain that we want to get along with other people. And that's why people who are alone usually fall into depression or sadness because they don't have that. It's a need. It's a primitive need. So closed off defensive and wary until... People are closed off, defensive, and wary of others until they feel that they can trust someone or trust you, and there's a sense of rapport. Only then will people begin to open up. And this this leads all the way back to, again, to Module 7 where we talked about people help people who they know, like, and trust. This is because of this primitive need for trust and rapport. People like to feel or need to feel heard, understood, acknowledged, and appreciated And because of that, people will always look externally for external validation and approval from other people. In terms of, if you remember in module two, when we talked about mindset and we talked about values, a lot of people, and and this may have been you as well, but most people define success by approval from other people that they respect. And again, that comes from a primitive need to be accepted by the group and to be accepted by leaders or people who they highly respect. And then third is reciprocation. And when someone does something for you or gives you something, you pretty much feel like, oh, I, now I need to do something for them. That is, that's human nature. That is a primitive response that has been conditioned into us for hundreds of thousands of years. And that's also why a lot of people feel guilty if you go out of your way to do something for them and then they don't do anything back. Now, that actually could fall into some scary parts of manipulation. I don't ever recommend trying to manipulate someone by going, by deceiving them. That's wrong. It's not right. But in terms of reciprocation, it is important to know that that is one way to influence somebody. And you can do it ethically and morally. One way that you could do this is go out of your way to help somebody. And you don't do it with the expectation of they will do something for you because who knows, you're not that person. But if you consistently invest in other people and improve other people's lives, things will come back to you. You will be reciprocated for it. 
So in terms of influencing and how you can think about applying this third emotional pattern, or this, this human need, build trust and rapport with people. You need to build the relationship with someone before you can ever hope to influence or negotiate with them. And then secondly is be the first to give. If you are the first to give in a situation, more often than not, they're going to be a lot more likely to give back to you as well. And now the fourth emotional pattern is self-interest and power. So people want to feel important and recognized. And you've probably had it before where someone has said something to you that um, either they made a comment to you that made you feel bad or put you down or they said something where it was disrespectful to you and you took it really personally. That's because they pretty much either they, they made you question your sense of self-worth, which means that you will do everything you can to defend it. And that's why people take negative comments so personally. So people are constantly trying to compare themselves to others and they're constantly seeking approval and acceptance of others, which means that because they're looking externally for validation, at the same time, they're judging other people. So this is really important to keep in mind when working with other people and trying to influence other people. All right. People are motivated by self-interest. This is so important. Never, ever, ever forget this. And if there's anything you take away from this entire negotiation part one about human nature, this is probably the most important part. People are motivated by self-interest. So, and they're even more motivated by self-interest than they are by gratitude, sympathy, or fairness. So gratitude, think of that as you did something for someone else. And then sometime later on down the road, in your mind, you're like, well, I did this for them, so they should do this for me. Well, that's not always going to be the case because, again, people will value their self-interest more often or, or more strongly than they will a sense of gratitude. Sympathy, exact same thing. More people will be motivated by self-interest than feeling sorry for you or wanting, you know, oh, you know, I'd love to help and then they do something for you. More often than not, it needs to be self-motivated for them. And then fairness when and this is this is where things c can turn ugly where people have seen you know in personal relationships or in professional relationships where if you try to define fairness it's very difficult because at the end of the day fairness is a perspective fairness is very subjective and that's why if you need to appeal to either fairness or the other person's self interest usually and more often than not the self interest will be a lot more influencing than a sense of fairness. So people will always seek more resource, resources, control, and importance. And this is also important to keep in mind. So the reason that humans habitually do this is because with more resources, control, and importance, it increases someone's ability to influence their own life, but also other people's lives. So the biggest takeaway here is always, always, always appeal to the other person's self-interests. And in order to know the other person's self-interest, you need to be empathetic. You need to understand to be willing to ask questions and see the other person's perspective. The moment you get locked up in your own head and all you care about is yourself, you're screwed. So always be willing to see the other person's perspective, understand it. And when you understand it, only then can you actually know how to position something to appeal to that person's interests. So... The other caveat, which is super important to keep in mind, people have very different interests and values. Just like we talked about module two with your beliefs, your values, and your identity, everybody thinks differently. Everybody believes different things and everybody values different things. And so you need to understand the other person before you can hope to um, influence or negotiate the other or negotiate with the other person. Okay, so every negotiation is different, but... Every negotiation can be approached with a common framework and core principles. So I want to quickly run you through this framework. So one, you have to build trust and rapport with the other person. And the best way that you can do this is ask the other person questions, actively listen, and then summarize their position. Now, what I mean by summarizing their position is repeating it back to them, almost like paraphrasing until they say, that's right. And when someone says that's right, it means that what you've 
told back to them or repeated back to them has gotten them to say that's right. And in their mind, they're saying, you understand my position. You understand my perspective. Yes, that's right. Once they know that you understand their perspective, they'll then be a lot more willing to hear your perspective because of reciprocation. So we want to build trust and rapport by asking questions, listening to the other person, and then summarizing their thoughts and ideas. Now, the other thing that we want to do is gather more information. And the way that we do that is by asking open-ended questions by starting with what or how. Now, the reason we don't want to say why, why it triggers people to become defensive. So imagine if you were to go out with a friend and you all of a sudden ask your friend, you know, you told me earlier that you did this thing. Why'd you do that? Well, immediately they're going to defend themselves because it sounds like you're judging them or their decision or their actions. So instinctively, we've been conditioned over our entire lives that when someone asks us why, we need to defend ourselves. So don't ask why questions when trying to influence or negotiate. Instead, ask what or how questions. So instead of asking somebody, why did you do this? Or why did you make that decision? Instead, you'd want to ask, well, what led you to make that decision? Because then you're not accusing them, but instead you're asking about what led, what were the the things that occurred or the ideas that popped up that led you to the decision. You're not accusing or questioning them, you're accusing or questioning the idea. Okay, so now the third part is you need to align your interests with their interests. Now, if you've been actively listening to them, you've summarized their positions and built trust and rapport, and you've gathered a lot more information about their needs, wants, and desires, you then know their interests. So then what you need to do, and this is, I'm sure you're probably seeing this is just just like the personal branding and the strategic positioning, once you know what they want, need, and desire, and you have trust and rapport, you then need to position your idea or your perspective in a way that aligns with their interests, and you need to provide the just or, or the logic to justify it. So when you align your interests with their interests and they can see that, emotionally, you're going to be in line with one another. But the part that you can't forget is the justifying logic. Sometimes they'll say, you know, I I really agree with you. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I just, I don't know, something about it. And then they just don't go through or they don't make the decision or they don't commit. It's because they're missing the logic. So align with their interests and then you have to provide the logic that allows them to say, yes, that makes sense at least to themselves. And sometimes, and I want to go back to the logic. So sometimes it might make sense to them and the logic is fair for them, but in their mind, they might be thinking of someone else where, so imagine that you're negotiating with a manager for the offer negotiation. Well, maybe the manager believes that what you proposed was a good idea and is fair. But in the manager's mind, the manager's thinking, how am I going to explain this to my boss? Well, that's a case where you need to know how to present the logic so that it makes sense not only to him or her, but to whoever it is that that person's worried about in their mind. Okay, so to influence someone in terms of a core principle, uh, write this down, keep this, you know, all these core principles, I hope you write these down and keep these with you forever because these are human behaviors and tendencies and this is programmed and conditioned into us. So to influence somebody, You must know and appeal to their self-interests. The next principle is to influence somebody. You must have trust and rapport with that person because trust and rapport is the foundation for all communication that you have with someone. The next principle, to influence somebody, you must have the right voice, tonality, and body language. So what I mean by this is if your voice or your tonality is aggressive Or accusational. And what I mean by accusational is let's say like, you know, what led you to do that? Well, all right, that's a really aggressive tone. And of course, they're going to start defending themselves. But if you said, well, what, what led you to do that? It's more questioning. You're inviting them to share their thoughts and ideas, their perspective. So tonality is very important. And same with body language. How you look, your facial expressions, your gestures, your reaction and and how you're having that conversation is very important. Negotiation, final principle here, 
Negotiation is best done verbally and in real time versus written or recorded communication. Now, the most important part of this and the reason this is a principle is people are emotional, which we, we just talked about. People are very emotional, which means that when they're emotional, they're not thinking logically. People slip. Have you ever had it where you're really angry and you said something and you're just like, later on you think, oh, God, why did I say that? Oh, no. Or or you were in a position where you know, someone caught you off guard and you just said something and it was almost like, oh, that slipped. I should not have said that. I said too much. When you're talking in real time, it's a lot easier to influence and negotiate because people slip. People share too much information. People talk too much. People get emotional and they get irrational and then they say things or agree to things or commit that because you were having the conversation, they didn't have you know 24 hours or 48 hours or a long period of time to think logically through every single piece of it. So this works in two ways. One, when someone is trying to influence you, give yourself time. Never commit to something in the moment, especially if it's a really, really important decision because in that moment, your heart rate's probably going up, you've probably been producing a lot of stress hormone and your adrenaline and you're probably in the moment thinking, oh man, and then you're gonna make a split second decision, don't do it. Instead, back up, buy yourself time, give yourself 24 hours, two days, whatever is necessary to take a deep breath, calm down and think through everything logically and make the decision that's best for you. But on the flip side, if you're negotiating with somebody, you know that it's gonna usually play out better for you if you don't provide too much time for the other person to completely drop all emotion and then think through every single bit and piece of it logically over an extended period of time. Okay, so this is, um, again, the, the purpose of this first part was not just specific to your offer negotiation, but understanding what are some of the core principles and tendencies behind humans and then how can we apply this to our negotiations. Okay, so in part two, we are gonna dive into specifically thinking through how to approach your offer negotiation. And then um, that's all I have for this part one. I'll see you in part two.